Hi everyone, this is Dr. Song. With cataract surgery, the more you do it, the more you realize. It looks simple, until it isn't. Some days everything flows, other days it just doesn't. Every now and then you run into those head-scratching, almost unfair moments. Today's case was one of those, but I came away with another lesson, and a new chance to grow. Today's topic is reverse optic capture. Let's walk through it together. This is a very routine cataract surgery. As always, I put a lot of focus on the capsular hexis. It needs to be centered well and about 5 millimeters in size. Not too large, not too small. Everyone knows how important this step is. A well-made rexis versus a poor one. The difference is like night and day both in the final outcome and in how you manage complications if they arise. That's why I take my time, slowly, carefully, almost to the point of being tedious to watch. Of course, femtosecond lasers exist, but I don't use them. For me, the manual technique gives a stronger cut, and I feel more confident with it compared to the weaker edge from the laser. The surgery went smoothly, and we moved toward the final steps. To prepare for IOL insertion, I filled the capsular bag with viscoelastic. Then, as I always do, I inserted a preloaded one-piece IOL using the screw-type injector system. I inserted the I and A tip and began removing the viscoelastic, but then something felt off. The IOL looked tilted slightly shifted to one side. I thought, maybe it's just a bit of helon still left behind. Nothing unusual. And then... No. I didn't want to believe it. But it was true. A posterior capsule rupture. On the screen, yeah, you can see it. I was just blank for a moment. Hmm, what did I do wrong? Nothing seemed off. Everything looked fine, but this... This was the first time I'd ever had a rupture happen, right in the middle of I and A. Then I remembered, I'd actually seen a few similar cases on YouTube before. I guess it was just my turn to face it. Looking back, the cause must have been this. The tip of the IOL rubbing against the posterior capsule during insertion. That's the only explanation. Since then, I've made it a habit always flooding the bag with plenty of viscoelastic before inserting the lens. Anyway, what's done is done. Now the only focus is solving the problem. Take a breath, fill the chamber with viscoelastic. Carefully withdraw the I and A. In PCR, the first principle is simple. Minimize vitreous prolapse. Alright, let's first take stock of the situation. The capsulohexis is still intact, but from about 7 o'clock to 11 o'clock, roughly 120 degrees, there's no posterior capsule support. So with a one-piece IOL already sitting in the bag, what are the possible options? Plan A. Rotate the lens so that both haptics rest on the remaining capsule support. This can work. It's safe and effective but only when the area of rupture is relatively small. In this case, I wasn't so sure. It felt risky. It might look fine for a few days, but sometimes the vitreous starts to prolapse, causing the lens to tilt. And in some cases, the entire IOL can even drop back into the vitreous cavity. Plan B. Take out the one-piece IOL and place a three-piece lens in the sulcus. This is probably the most standard option the one most surgeons would choose. It's reliable, it's safe, and as you all know, a one-piece lens should never be placed in the sulcus. The thick haptics can rub against the iris and cause Ugh syndrome. Sometimes it happens late, years after surgery. That's why in the sulcus it should always be a three-piece lens. This time I decided to go with plan C. 
reverse optic capture. As you can see in the video, the haptics stay in the bag while the optic margin is gently brought up above the anterior capsule. By doing this, even a one-piece IOL can be stabilized safely and securely, even in the setting of a posterior capsule rupture. And toward the end of this video, we'll also look at the many reasons and the real advantages why every surgeon should know reverse optic capture. So, let's walk through it together. First, use the Sinsky hook to center the IOL. Then tilt it slightly by pressing one side down and push the optic edge forward up, over the capsulohexis margin. Now with one side captured, do the same on the other side. Because this particular lens platform is a bit thick and rigid, it didn't feel as easy as I expected. Honestly, it was tricky to tell at times whether the rex's margin was lying in front of the optic or behind it. The key is to go slow. Careful. Make sure not to tear the capsule. Once that's done, lift the iris a little to confirm the optic is truly captured. Press gently on the lens as well, just to check it's well seated. And unlike a three-piece lens, a one-piece IOL doesn't give you that cat-eye appearance at the haptic optic junction. Now it's time to remove the viscoelastic. And here, there's a very important point. Never use I and A. Even with low pressure, it's too risky. Always remove it manually, with simple irrigation only. Once the optic is securely captured, the anterior and posterior chambers are completely separated, so there's no risk of vitreous prolapse. That's why, if you compress the vitreous gently at the start with viscoelastic, you often don't even need a vitrectomy. Finally, I checked that the IOL is firmly fixed. Seal the incision with hydro sealing and complete the case. The next day, the IOL was perfectly stable. The only concern, posterior capsule opacity will likely develop early, so a YAG capsulotomy may be needed sooner rather than later. So, why should we learn reverse optic capture? I believe this has become an even more important question today. First, remember that optic capture itself comes in many forms, from the conventional sulcus optic capture to variations using the posterior capsular hexes. All of these ideas go back to the pioneers of the continuous curvilinear capsular hexes, Dr. Nurhan and Dr. Gimbel. If we could master all the variations, that would be ideal. But among them, reverse optic capture is especially useful. And here's why. With the growing demand for multifocal lenses, there are many situations where you still want to use a one-piece multifocal IOL. If you face a posterior capsule rupture during surgery, if negative dysphotopsia develops afterward, if a toric lens keeps rotating, or even if you need an IOL exchange in a post-YAG eye, reverse optic capture can give you a stable option. It really expands what's possible. So, what do you need to know about ROC? First, the capsulohexis is critical. It must be well centered, and if it's larger than 5mm, ROC becomes difficult. Smaller is actually better. You can always enlarge it later if needed. In cataract surgery, especially with multifocals, I recommend keeping the rexis around 4.5 to 5 mm, centered as precisely as possible. Second, the effective lens position shifts slightly forward, so the lens power calculation needs to account for that. Studies vary, but typically you see about a minus 0.3 diopter myopic shift compared to an in-the-bag placement. Many surgeons adjust for this when the IOL power is 24 diopter or higher, but often leave it unchanged for lower powers. So, that was today's case, and another chance to learn. If you found this useful, please consider subscribing, and thank you for watching.